I was at the interface, but I was in the process of changing field. I used to do photophysical chemistry and I just started working on nanocarbons because C60 was discovered in 1990 or the mass synthesis was discovered in 1990 and we started working on it. So we were completely involved into nanostructured carbons. So at the same time, uh, actually in 1989, I read this article by uh, Arosh and Klepton on cavity uh, quantum electrodynamics, which was for me a mind-blowing article. I still think it's a mind-blowing article because it described a physical process I didn't know existed, uh, as I had learned as a physical chemist, that you could actually control the radiative properties of molecules and that you could even change their properties significantly, perhaps by doing other experiments and this got me of course going on uh, this made me want to so maybe I should say this explain this that this this uh, from the from what was written in the article I understood that you had to make little cavities about preferably in, like in metal and I thought if I had a cylinder and I put molecules inside I could actually get a sort of 2d cavity I uh, mean two directions in x y uh, direction and I could probe the molecules inside the cavities by sending some UV light out looking at fluorescence on the other side. That was the basic idea. And then I, I asked a Japanese colleague if he could make me such small cavities about 300 nanometers in diameter. And, and at the time he, he said it would be very easy. It sounded to me like it was very easy to make. And, uh, and then he asked me how many and then I asked him for one uh, I thought I'd work, since I work in square centimeters, I asked him to put one every micron in a square centimeter, so roughly 100 million, not roughly, 100 million holes, cylinders, and which I can tell you that he didn't, he looked surprised, but I didn't understand the element of the surprise or what he was uh, feeling, and I thought he thought that was okay, and it actually wasn't okay. He only made that one sample for me, and uh, but thanks to this, this cultural and, and a misunderstanding, linguistic and cultural misunderstanding, I was able to get a very large sample that I could uh, look through with my naked eye and I could see that this whole array transmitted a lot of light. And then we took spectra and we found that it indeed transmitted more light and actually hit the holes and Hans Bede's theory tells you that there should be less light should go through than actually impinges on the hole. And then, you know, that one thing led to the next. Most people didn't believe me and no patents were taken. And, but some people encouraged me to continue, to get to the bottom of it. And it would take another seven years before I met somebody who told me it was surface plasmons. That was Peter Wolf, who used to be at MIT and then at NEC Princeton. Then we did experiments with other colleagues and we finally published it in 1998, so nine years after the first observation. I don't know, it, that I wouldn't know, because it came naturally as, you know, everybody invents, uh, I know it's, some people feel they invented this word, but it was, you know, it's, it was surface plasmons, and then we talked about electronics, photonics, so plasmonics was a natural, uh, you know, I think many people were thinking the same way, you know, it's like, uh, Yeah, a little bit, actually, uh, because I had seen some of the work of Betzig uh, and uh, on SNOMs and SOMs. And, uh, and uh, actually, he came to NEC to give a talk and said there wasn't much future in NSOMs. <laughs> this was in, in the early 90s, and he published a paper in Science about that, uh, where he says there's, there's a problem of light getting through a single small aperture, and this will be the limiting factor. That's, we already knew that we can get a lot of light through, but I didn't obviously tell him that. And, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I never thought I would do any near field optics in that sense, and I ended up doing some, but I never uh, indirectly through the work on surface plasma photonics. But I had, uh, actually I never had a particular interest in measuring single molecules uh, or uh, doing some experiments. They seemed extremely difficult and uh, I wouldn't have the patience, unlike you, unlike you. <laughs>
<laughs> that takes patience to do. No, really, it does. It's a, it's a dedication which not everybody has. Not initially, because I, uh, it's, not, it's not until first we actually, when, we, when I understood that, surface, I was, some, uh, that Peter Wolf told us were surface plasmons, and indeed we, we could show it by the data we collected that there were surface plasmons involved in the transmission process, then we started thinking what it, implied, what it meant, and then EC said to us, okay, 100, 100 million holes, that's fine, but for us it would be much more important to have a single hole that's super bright for data storage, so you can imagine why. And that's how little by little this, this, uh, this uh, notion of a single hole bullseye with a, the antenna around. And of course that made, made me at least uh, uh, aware of the fact that you could structure the, the metal and affect the near field and therefore the far field. And that's how I learned about Dieter Paul and the people of, his, of that community which I, I even had no experience in this because they didn't come from optics, you know. So I learned this just as I, as I went along, you know. And, uh, but it sort of was a revelation for me that you could do this. I mostly went to the Materials Research Society meetings, sometimes APS. It was sort of material science or physics conferences and Gordon conferences but often to talk into a community that were not familiar with the subject I was, uh, you know, that I was presenting. I was sort of always a bit on the odd, odd end of the, uh, the subject, the, the community I was in. Well, it comes back to the original paper by Arosh and Kleppner on cavity QED and uh, the uh, the, what were they implying was that you could, as I said earlier, you could modify the properties, the radiative properties, but in that paper it also talks about light matter strong coupling. That, I didn't catch that at the time, quite frankly. Uh, that I, it's only by rereading the paper years afterwards that I understood that they had said it all. But uh, they were, it was actually, in, we use these whole arrays and we put molecules not in the holes anymore because we realized we could just put them on top just to have create surface plasma molecule interactions and then we got this split dispersion curve and uh, Bill Barnes who was visiting my lab at that time said to me oh this must be strong coupling and I said strong coupling yeah light matter strong coupling and I had no idea what that was even though it wasn't there I was in the paper and the but what struck me which didn't strike probably other people, and that's where I came with a fresh view because I was not in this business, was that what did it do to the molecules? Because when I had, we had a splitting of 0 0.2, 250 milli electron volts, and that's huge for a molecule. So we reset when Bill said, no, they're real states. New states are formed, and I had this idea that we can get these hybrid light matter states. Well, I said, if they're new states, if you do this by any chemical means, that you have a new material with different properties. I mean, it's a, it's a new molecule. And so the only thing that I wanted to do from then on was to explore what the properties was, because most people thought there were no, no changes. As you know, even, even, uh, even uh, today, a lot of people believe that what we are finding is not real. But I'm confident that with time, people will find that hopefully that most of the things we have done, unless we made some mistakes, is, is real. Nanophotonics, I mean, when I, when I think of how much the nanophotonic field has expanded, it's quite impressive. I mean, we see this in this meeting. It covers a vast, uh, vastly different areas. It goes from biology to chemistry to physics, quantum physics. And, uh, and it's taken on directions that I, I think nanophotonics has taken on directions that I never expected it uh, to do. And in many ways, in some areas, it's becoming sort of routine. I mean, when you can buy is, uh, machines like uh, the work of Stefan Hell or Murner and so forth, uh, that when you can buy equipment commercially that you can implement and get sub wavelength resolution. Uh, it takes on a whole new life. Uh, the, the scientific, the broad scientific implications are clear, you know. And, uh, and also from a fundamental point of view, it's, uh, 
it gives us a new vision of what's going on, which I don't think we had before. And this allows us to, those conceptual understanding of this new framework of looking at things actually propels the field forward. It's, you know, it's like the discovery of carbon-60 and nobody foresaw what it would lead to, but led to all kinds of other things, uh, which are more important than actually C60 itself. It's what it led to and the understanding that led to that, that impact nanomaterials. And I think nanophotonics is the same, uh, very much the same way. Uh, I think uh, that's the fun thing about science. Personally, I'll tell you, I could just talk what I think is personal. Uh, I think the understanding of the a sort of better understanding by more scientists of the vacuum field, I think, and of course there's a whole field of people working in the vacuum field, but how that impacts everything we're doing when we don't think about it, uh, like the, the zero-point energy of a, of, a, of a resonance which still impacts even in the dark and uh, interactions. That comes out, of course, of strong coupling, but I think more generally it must play a role more, more prevalent than we think my, for people working at this interface. Uh, I'm also personally f fascinated about entanglement, what we can do with that through the field, through the near field, of the f near to far field, sort of intermediate field, let's put it that way and have a better understanding of that process, you know, because, you know, and understand what, how it's described. There's a different things that understanding how it's described and actually conceptually interiorizing the, the concept of what it is. And I don't know, I, it's very hard to find, it's very hard, I think the best way to understand something is actually doing the experiments and predicting something, see it come out, if you've understood it correctly. It's what Stefan Hell was saying in his talk. You know, when you have really understood something, you can make predictions that something will affect, and then that's actually a proof that you have understood something. And, uh, and this is the kind of, I still think, the areas where we still need to collectively, individually, at least me individually, need to, I could, I would enjoy have a better understanding uh, of certain of these fundamental processes.